Today's video will include war stories, culinary fame and notoriety, secret intelligence work, shark repellent, over 700 pounds of butter, and a very tall woman with a give em hell attitude. If you grew up in America, there is a good chance you have heard the name Julia Child, and you may even be aware she was a well-loved name in the culinary world who had cooking shows throughout much of the second half of the 20th century. But did you know she worked for the OSS? I'd wager your grandparents didn't even know that bit, but let me know in the comments if they did, I'm curious. But today, I'm going to tell you all about this fascinating woman and her largely unknown time working for the Office of Strategic Services in World War II. But before we move on to today's story, though... Hello! My name is Brad, and this is the channel for history lovers who prefer an interesting video over one of those god-awful textbooks. I do all the boring reading for you, and then I tell you all about the best bits that you came to hear about. If this sounds like your kind of channel, then welcome home to Lest We Forget. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Just do it! Julia Child was a household name in American homes for decades, not just because she was a great cook, but because of her vibrant personality and charm. She had an operatic voice, a warm and friendly smile, and was unapologetically herself until the day she died. If you're not going to be ready to fail, you're not going to learn how to cook. That's what that little lecture is all about. After about seven years of writing and research, and a couple of years of requested tweaking and restructuring from publishers, Julia's first book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 1, was published in 1962. In 1963, Julia's first cooking show, The French Chef, aired nationally, kicking off her fame in the culinary niche of television. Her blunders and mistakes were left in her cooking show recordings because they didn't have quite the post-production capability that we have today, but this made her content relatable and funny to people. She was liked by viewers right off the bat. Like this. Well, that didn't go very well. Julia didn't make meals that were low sodium, per se. She was notorious for cooking with or in butter in many of her dishes. According to PBS, during the four years that her cooking show Baking with Julia aired in the 1990s, Julia used a total of 753 pounds of butter in four years. Over her career in cooking, which lasted until her death, Julia made many different cooking shows and published many different corresponding cookbooks. She was awarded many awards, big and small, for her contributions in the world of cooking in America and France, including a Knight of France's Legion of Honor Award and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But y'all didn't come here to listen to a lot of widely known information about Julia Child. You want to know how an upbeat, jovial, spunky cooking show lady could have a background in American intelligence work, don't you? Well, let's have a brief look at Julia's early life and see how she went from carefree Cali girl to intelligence work for the U.S. government before her life in cooking. Shall we? Born Julia McWilliams on August 15, 1912 in Pasadena, California. Julia was not someone born into poverty, quite the opposite actually. She was born into a very successful family. Her father, a successful real estate investor, and her mother, an heiress to a well-established paper company. The big bucks. In 1930, Julia had just graduated from a prestigious boarding school and was off to Smith College in Massachusetts to study becoming a writer. Apparently, she had been enrolled at Smith College at birth, according to Julia. Whether that be officially or unofficially, she did not say. With such a privileged upbringing, her only limitations would have been interpersonal, if any. Dubbed wild by her college peers, known to be a prankster, a talented athlete, and even a pretty good small game hunter, Julia was not a boring person, to say the least. She graduated from Smith College in 1934 and begun working for the advertising division of a popular home furnishing company at the time as a copywriter, beginning in 1935. Her goal at the time being to become a famous female novelist and copywriting would simply be a stepping stone on her way to her dream. 
This was an okay start to life for some, perhaps, but she wasn't satisfied with things as they were, no. She felt restless, needing to make a change, and due to her mother's failing health, Julia moved back to California, still working for the same company as she was in New York. She was tending family, working away, and probably had her bright smile on much of the time. But she was a dreamer, and she knew that she wasn't going to be able to stomach work that she was not interested in forever. Make your dreams come true! Just do it! An abrupt change happened around this time, however, in 1939, when she was fired from the company she was working for over a mix-up with a document. The company, whose name I won't say, listed the official reason given for firing Julia as gross insubordination. My kind of gal. It may not have been how she envisioned leaving the company, but it was over nonetheless. Now, what was she to do? She had a direction for years, and now she found herself back at the drawing board, questioning her path. Well, what do most well-to-do women do when their original plan falls apart? They join the war effort? They join the war effort. No. But seriously, a couple of years after she was fired, Pearl Harbor was attacked by Japan. This impacted Julia greatly, as it did many Americans. Her mother had passed away by this point, and she no longer needed to stay in California to care for her. She wanted to go help her country somehow, and so go help she did. At the onset of her journey to help her country, Julia volunteered as a stenographer for the Red Cross Pasadena chapter and worked in the aircraft warning service. Being the adventurous type, however, she also fancied joining the military. But like the American war hero, Audie Murphy was initially rejected from joining the military due to his size, so was Julia Child when she applied to join the Women's Army Corps and the Women's Accepted Volunteer Emergency Service, or WAVES. Not for being too small, though, as Audie was. You see, Julia stood at a towering six foot two inches tall. She probably scared the recruiters when she looked down at them or something like that. But nevertheless, just because joining the military didn't pan out didn't mean she was going to do nothing. Julia went to Washington, like many women at the time, to find a way to help her country outside of the military. Initially, she was hired as a senior typist in the research unit for the Office of War Information, cataloging over 10,000 different files. This was mind-numbing to Julia, but she had her eyes set on this fascinating new intelligence office that was recruiting all different types of qualified American citizens. Finally, after much toil, they saw her potential and brought her on board. And so began Julia's career in American intelligence work. Drop a comment if you can think of any other celebrities who were spies or something similar, and if their story is as fascinating as Julia's, I might just do a video about them. Who knows? It was now 1942, and Julia was hired as a junior research assistant for the secret intelligence branch known as the OSS. The notes from her interview stating, Good impression, pleasant, alert, capable, and very tall. Starting out as an entry-level research assistant, which wasn't exactly espionage missions in active war zones overseas, but Julia entered the new chapter in her life with big hopes. So, Julia put her nose to the grindstone, determined to show upper management that she had more to offer the organization. It didn't take long, and her efforts were recognized. Julia was then promoted to a position with much more responsibility. Granted, she was doing a lot of typing in her career still, but it was getting more interesting. As she was working her way up the administrative ladder from the bottom, more qualified, multilingual, traveled women were being trained for coveted positions in espionage work. Julia's dream. This was discouraging to Julia on one hand, but motivating on the other. She went on to work in several different roles for the OSS, gaining more and more responsibility with each position, eventually working for the leader of the OSS himself, Wild Bill Donovan. As the OSS was a relatively new concept in itself, it did not bear the rigid structure you see today in the more established CIA. It was very full of intelligent, cultured personalities from all over the country in all different industries, and would have been a fascinating place to work, right up Julia's alley. While Julia didn't ever go on any actual spy missions, she did get to fulfill some of her desires of being cultured and traveled as she volunteered for overseas projects within the OSS, and was eventually selected to go. She took up a position in intelligence organization for the OSS division in present-day Sri Lanka from 1944 to 1945, and eventually moved to their division in Kunming, China in 1946, where she remained until her time with the OSS came to a close at the end of the war. The OSS division in China was actually in an area that saw battle while Julia was working there. Julia had top secret clearance in the OSS as the head of the registry for the OSS secretariat during her career there. 
literally all of the secret intelligence files for the several branches of the OSS were her responsibility to organize. Nothing came through that office that she didn't personally see. In 1943, Julia was assigned to an experimental project to create a shark repellent, although she wouldn't become known as one of its creators until many years later. At the time, the Navy was having trouble admitting that sailors were ever being eaten by sharks during naval encounters at sea. Within the Navy's leadership, the consensus was that it wasn't happening frequently enough to warrant acknowledgement, and was simply easier to tell mothers that their brave sons had died valiantly at sea rather than face the fact that they may not have been dead until well after they actually hit the water. That is, until a shark that had human remains in its stomach was caught, and those remains were proven to belong to a sailor in the U.S. Navy by via fingerprints. And that lowered the morale amongst the sailors who read the media, obviously, making it difficult for the higher-ups to ignore this shark problem any longer. And so, a project to develop a shark repellent was finally started. The OSS Emergency Sea Rescue Equipment Section was tasked with the job. Now you might be saying, Brad, sharks don't like eating people, of course they wouldn't need to make shark repellent. But keep in mind, 20 plus sailors had been victims of shark attacks during naval encounters in the three years prior, so it's a big deal to, you know, people who lost their, you know, sailor son who was eaten by a shark. They care. Not only would they be solving the problem of sailors meeting a toothy demise, but it would also give them something to repel sharks from underwater mines used to destroy enemy submarines that had been being set off by sharks. Julia was assigned as executive assistant to Captain Harold J. Coolidge Jr. and Dr. Henry Field. Together, Coolidge and Julia successfully created a shark repellent using a combination of copper acetate and black dye. The copper acetate created the smell of decaying shark, and the black dye was in the form of a small cake, which helped it disperse slowly. Together, the combination would repel nearby sharks not wanting to meet a similar fate. This method of repelling sharks is still in use today. Her first recipe, and it was not even delicious, allegedly. Julia's marriage to Paul Child was not a secret as it happened after the war. So, you may be aware of their relationship, but the real story of how they met is different than people were told for many years. Julia had achieved the excitement and intrigue she had hoped for with her work, and while doing so had slowly begun to fall for someone who worked with her for most of her career with the OSS, being Paul Child. Initially, he wasn't interested in Julia romantically either, as some letters to his brother state, and even dated a few women who worked for the OSS to kind of write in front of Julia. Paul wasn't your typical egotistical playboy going after every girl in the office, though. Actually, he was a quiet, intriguing loner type with a very sophisticated palate and a wealth of worldly experience. Not to mention, he had a black belt in judo. Julia eventually came to love all those aspects about Paul, though, despite not being attracted to him physically at first. Though, when she finally did try to win him over, even though he had slowly grown fond of her as well, he was concerned that she would return to the civilian world after the war and go back to being the rich Republican man's daughter, so to speak. Julia's father was a very conservative man who had strong beliefs, and those kind of conflicted with Paul's more liberal mindset. He foresaw future headaches here, and that fueled his resistance to start a relationship with Julia despite his growing attraction. True to form, though, Julia wasn't going to give up, and eventually Paul told her that you know they would see how things went when they moved back to the States after the war, just to confirm that he wasn't right in his suspicions. And that was enough for Julia. After the war ended and the two moved back to their respective states in America, Julia remained interested in Paul. She subscribed to newspapers that Paul read, much to her father's dismay, and even started taking cooking classes at the famous Le Cordon Bleu Culinary School so that she could make Paul home-cooked food that would please his very sophisticated palate. For having had such a successful cooking career, you may be surprised to learn that at first, Julia actually struggled with cooking. Butting heads with Madame Brazar, her instructor didn't help either, and she actually failed in her first year at the school. Luckily, Master Chef Max Bunard took her under his wing, and with his teaching style, Julia began to thrive in the kitchen. After failing her first year in Le Cordon Bleu, Julia graduated, and her certificate of completion was actually dated back to the year prior. Julia's efforts were noticed during all this, and by that point, Paul was willing to put up with the learning curve in Julia's cooking in order to be with her. He was hooked. 
They were married not long after on September 1st, 1946, bearing stitches and bandages from a wreck that they were actually in the day before their wedding. Nothing was going to stop these two from getting married. And the rest is history. If y'all enjoyed learning about Julia and her secret career today and want to watch more videos like this one, then please hit that subscribe button and leave a like on the video. It would be greatly appreciated. And don't forget, you saw it here on Lest We Forget. See y'all later.